Senator Vance, uh, the U.S. did have a diplomatic deal with Iran to temporarily pause parts of its nuclear program, and President Trump did exit that deal. He recently said, just five days ago, the U.S. must now make a diplomatic deal with Iran because the consequences are impossible. Did he make a mistake? You have one minute. Well, first of all, Margaret, diplomacy is not a dirty word, but I think that's something that Governor Waltz just said is quite extraordinary. You yourself just said Iran is as close to a nuclear weapon today as they have ever been. And Governor Waltz, you blame Donald Trump. Who has been the vice president for the last three and a half years? And the answer is your running mate, not mine. Donald Trump consistently made the world more secure. Pretty good answer. Pretty truthful answer. Joining me now to discuss the debate, foreign policy, WW3, and other things, my friend, host of America on Trial, and author of Israel and Civilization, Josh Hammer. Okay, Josh, before we get to Israel and Civilization, Iran, the end of the planet, I hope that's not too dramatic, let's talk a little bit about the debate. I might as well toss this one to you. What were your impressions? Jesse, I thought JD absolutely slaughtered it. I, I mean, I had high yeah. expectations, a, and he surpassed those expectations. In fact, I think it was the single most thoroughly dominant debate performance I've ever seen a Republican politician give in my adult lifetime. I mean, I mean that, that 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 is my actual uh, unvarnished, straight inject, you know, injected straight into the veins stance. I, I mean, every single question. He, he handled it basically as well as you could possibly handle. I mean, the January 6th exchange may be like not quite ideal, but I mean, he basically was what was like 20 to 25 wins and then like one draw as far as the questions were concerned. I mean, what America saw is someone who has done the reading, who knows what he is talking about, who was a public policy savant, who was keeping it civil and substantive. And, you know, probably even most important in this home stretch he came across as 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 very likable and, and relatable and a good guy. His shout out to his wonderful wife Usha was excellent, trying to kind of to kind of push back against this ridiculous left wing disinformation campaign that he's weird or this childless cat ladies nonsense. I thought he absolutely slayed it, Jesse. And you know, if if the whole campaign can stay this laser targeted in this final month, I think that they're going to win come November. Well, I hope you're right now. It, he was. It was dynamite. That's one of the better debate performances I've ever seen myself. Okay, let's shift off of that and let's deal with what's happening over there, Iran and Israel. Obviously, everyone knows who we're rooting for here. Let's get past all that crap. What is happening? What are the capabilities of Israel? What are the capabilities of Iran? Netanyahu has said a couple things publicly that sound like, sound like he sounds like a man who's hell-bent on regime change in Iran. Josh, what are we dealing with over there? What's going on? Jesse, look, uh, you know this part of the world very well. I mean, you you served honorably mm -hmm. for, for our country over there. I mean, you, you, you know, I think, firsthand what we're dealing with here. We're, specifically when it comes to Iran, we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a, a jihadist theocracy that, that has been a, a stain ever since they overthrew the Shah back in 1979. I mean, that's really what we're dealing with. I mean, this is a country that has not had diplomatic relations, not just with Israel, but with the United States ever since 1979. I actually was speaking at a YAF conference, the Young America's Foundation conference, a couple of months ago, and I and, and and someone came up to me. Guy must have been in his late twenties. He, he spent the first sixteen years of his life in Tehran, and what he told me was that from kindergarten through through when he left, when he was in high school, their version of the Pledge of Allegiance in school is they put their hand over their heart, and they say in Farsi and Persian, they say, "I solemnly vow to do all that I can to." to destroy the little Satan of Israel and the big Satan in America. They, they say that in school every single day. And and, and they've acted oh, upon geez. that. I, I mean, they have literally acted upon this ever since ever since the regime took over. It, it began with the infamous hostage crisis during the end of the Jimmy Carter administration. Ronald Reagan freed the hostages. And, and they fund a sprawling network of jihadist proxies all throughout the Middle East. They fund Hamas. Hezbollah is a direct proxy of the Iranian regime. The Houthis in Yemen are a direct proxy of the Iranian regime there. And, and ultimately what they want is not just the destruction of Israel, but I mean, I just told you what they want. They literally say it in school. They, they want the death of America. And we now see that they have ballistic missile capability of reaching at least anywhere they want in the entire Middle East within a, a matter of minutes. Th those missiles took, I think, 12 minutes to get from Iran to Israel. That's really not a lot of time. So they clearly have gotten a little bit more technologically sophisticated over, over, the, over the past few years, which ought to be harrowing as they get ever closer to a nuclear weapon. Look, Jesse, I guess in summation here, 
Looking at what's happening in the Middle East right now, looking at the death of the arch Hezbollah terrorist Hassan Nasrallah in Beirut, Lebanon, he was the Ayatollah's handpicked guy to lead Hezbollah. He was in there for 32 years from 92 to 2004, almost as long as I've been alive. Hezbollah is crippled like never before. And Hezbollah is Iran's insurance policy. Hezbollah was there to make sure that Israel does not actually go after the nuclear strikes. So with Hezbollah crippled like never before, and with Iran now doing for the second time this year following, following April, this unprecedented assault, hundreds of missiles. Thank God there were there were, there were no casualties. I think that Netanyahu was born for this moment. I think Netanyahu has, has been waiting for this moment, furthermore, for his entire political career. I think you're going to start seeing some attacks on the nuclear sites. I think you're going to start seeing some, some Iranian naval vessels start going down in flames, maybe some attacks on some oil fields. I, I, and I, I probably stops there. I don't think they're going to go for the kill shot on the Ayatollah himself, but He's going to take advantage of this opportunity because he has to. I mean, this is an existential war at this point. And unfortunately, I, I, I don't see it getting quiet anytime soon. Josh, from a numbers perspective, Israel's not a big place, obviously, as you well know. But it's not a big place. They don't have that many troops. Technologically, they are advanced. Obviously, they're a lot sharper intelligence-wise than everyone around them. And that has saved a lot of lives and cost a lot of terrorist lives. But... I am worried about numbers. They don't have that many young men. It, it, it's tough. Look, they have they have they, they have conscription. I mean, you have to serve in the military if you if you are a, a yeah. young Jewish man. For for non Jews, it's optional. But but thank God, a lot of Christians and Druze and and, and some Muslims do, do enlist in the military. They're stretched thin right now. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they've been fighting a multi front war for, for a while now, especially with the ground incursion in, into Lebanon. But they're, they're not running out of troops. I mean, we can get into the weeds if we want to. They had this whole debate about whether to forcibly conscript the, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox Jews. That, that's a whole kind of domestic policy debate over in Israel. So I, they're, they're limited, but, but, but they're okay. I mean, this is a, a militarily, technologically sophisticated country right now. Israel does not need troops. They, they do not need a, a, any foreign country to, to fight their, their wars for them. In fact, this is actually... It's really doctrine. I mean, the entire point of the founding of a Jewish state was that the Jews fight their own wars for the sake of the Jews' own self-determination, for their own destiny. So, I mean, that has that has been Israeli doctrine since day one. So they, they would never, 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 ever ask another country to directly get involved in their conflicts. If they actually do, as I predict, and start taking direct military action inside Iran, I think the only thing that is necessary from the United States is really diplomatic cover, to basically provide cover of the United Nations, things like that. Maybe there are a couple of heavy bombs that Israel is a little short on. They could use an, an ASAP shipment of maybe. I'm not entirely sure, honestly. But really, diplomatic cover is the main thing. Beyond that, I'm not sure a whole lot else is needed other than to let them just do their thing and patrol their own region from our mutual enemies. Yeah, go handle their business. All right, Josh, I cannot let you go without asking about lawfare. There's a lot. Trump, it seems like it was only 10 minutes ago, he was facing felony cases in every jurisdiction in the United States of America. Now we don't hear very much about any of it anymore. Is it all gone? Is it all going to come rushing back in next week? Where are we at with all this? Well, uh, it, it, it hasn't really gone anywhere, to be honest with you. It's fallen off our radar a little bit because the world is basically on fire. As you just said, I mean, I mean, we have horrific biblical level flooding in Western North Carolina. We have this longshoreman strike. We have the, the brink of potentially all out war in the Middle East. So it, it's still happening. It's just fallen off our radar a little bit. So, I mean, so-called special counsel Jack Smith, by the way, I, I, I love to call him so-called special counsel because Judge Aileen Cannon in Florida accurately ruled that he's not a legitimate special counsel. But Jack Smith is still bringing his case in Washington, D.C. And by the way, if he were a reasonable prosecutor, he would have dropped that case a very long time ago. He's doing so in direct defiance of multiple Supreme Court opinions, in direct defiance of the Trump versus United States immunity case, in direct defiance of the Fisher case, which pertained to subsection 1512 for the J6ers. He, ha he, he left in those two charges on that same statute in the indictment. But what he's trying to do, Jesse, his most recent court filing is trying to make public large swaths of his 180-page legal brief in the January 6th case. Let's think about this. We're in October. Why would Jack Smith want to make public a lot of January 6th material right before an election? It's obviously election interference. There is no other reason to do this. In fact, the Department of Justice's own internal manual, there's a justice manual direct, direct part of the manual that says you cannot 
make any prosecutorial decision if there would even be a perceived effect of putting a thumb on the scale of the election. Jack Smith does not, doesn't care for such niceties because the Democrat lawfare complex has one goal and one goal in mind, which is all out victory. They won't let anything get in their way. The other case is just real quick. Um, the Florida case, classified docs were waiting on an appeal at the 11th Circuit based in Georgia. The New York case, sentencing was pushed until after the election. The other case, the Georgia case, is actually going to come back on our radar on the next two to three weeks as well because the Court of Appeals there in Georgia is going to reconsider Fonnie Willis's dismissal or lack thereof. So it's all happening, Jesse. It's just a little bit more in the background. He is Josh Hammer. His new book is Israel in Civilization. If you know Josh like I do, I'm sure it will be wonderful, Josh. My friend, appreciate you, brother. I would thank you for coming to my YouTube channel, but I know how brilliant it is, and I know you love it here. So subscribe and watch. We're going to start really ramping things up and putting some funny stuff, some interesting stuff out there, some collaborations. Either way, my YouTube channel is officially the place to be. So stick around.